I have a guest on today that's an inventor and he's a successful inventor and he's licensed products, but we're gonna talk about one particular product, Josh, that you've licensed today. So thank you for coming on InventRight TV. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. It's an honor to be on the show. Wouldn't watch <laughs> well, your, uh, your channel for a long time. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know your story a little bit, Yep. but I think our audience is gonna absolutely love your story about one of your pet um, products that you licensed, okay? Yeah. So, so could you tell us a little bit about what that product is, show it, give us the name and kind of what it does, and we'll cut in, we'll find some other stuff that's out on the internet to, to sure. cut it into. So what is it? It's a, it's a pet toy, what is it? We have a ball launcher, it's called the Squeak and Throw, and that's the name it's been given finally, because we've gone through many, many different names. Um, what we did was my dog was averse to um, being uh, groomed. So we added grooming bristles to the backside of the brush or to the launcher so that when my dog was uh, close by after squeaking this button to get him excited to come back after fetching, um, I would uh, brush him with this kind of nice contour on the backside of the launcher and it would deshed all of the fur. And then I'd turn around and take the ball out. I'd uh, put it into the launcher, we'd huck it, and then I'd squeak the button to get him excited to come back again and kind of repeat that whole process. So wait so, a minute, wait a minute. So this is a, a a ball launcher for dogs. It is. First and foremost, a ball launcher. Okay. And I've had dogs before and retrievers that love to retrieve balls. And you basically throw your arm out. Um, yeah. And so this is a very helpful product. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, ch the chuck it came out with it first, right? It, it, I made an improvement upon an existing product. So we had one. And I took some bristles, I put them on the back of that one. And as we went along, we started to make more improvements upon it like with the squeaker button. And uh, we also added these cool characters on the ball okay. because when we looked at the profile of the product, it had this really cool dynamic kind of attitude to it. So as we went along, we added this additional kind of marketing now, feature to it. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Josh, you're telling me and you know I love this part. So yeah. there's a product that's out there um, that's been out there now for quite a while. What's it called? It's called the Chuck It. The Chuck It. And I'm sure it's been out there for quite a few years, hasn't it? Yeah, the patent just ran up this last October. Wow. And so you, you looked at that and you said, wow, there could be some improvements uh, to this product that's been selling fairly well. That's a pretty smart thing to do, isn't it? It was, it was, you know, I just wanted to find a solution for my dog in the beginning. Okay. Um, but then when I started researching the patents and realizing that that patent was coming to a close, <laughs> I still had not only, not only because it was coming to close and this was again, well, let's go back like seven years. It took a while for this to come to market. So at that time I knew I still had some, they had some legs. Um, so we had to figure out a workaround and the way we did that is that the main uh, uh, independent claim of the Chuck It was that it was a half spherical structure that housed the ball. Okay. So because we decided to add these grooming bristles on the outside of the edge, which also is another grooming aspect, which is actually called a de-shedding blade, okay. um, we basically created a de-shedding blade that's connected to the shaft, which is also has a bridge. So it kind of got around uh, – hmm that half spherical structure, which were these tines. Okay. So that was really in the 13th hour, honestly. Okay. Um, I was showing this to my patent um, agent at the time, and he's like, I think you're infringing on their main claim, because I wrote my own patent. Okay. So we had all these cool features, but we would have never gotten all this, and we would have never been able to bring it to market because of the way the ball was picked up. Okay. So that Clever. was kind of a big deal. Um, and so that, that was just my my um, inexperience, I think. So you, and you worked around it. We did work around it in the 13th hour. Yeah. Well, you know what's crazy about that? We always talk about at InventRight and on this channel how to write a, a well-written provisional patent application that has workaround language a little bit, like steal it from yourself. And apparently they didn't do a good job with that, did they? Well, that was me writing the provisional. <laughs> so, yeah. But that I've initial... But that initial uh, filing, could they have made it a little bit broader to stop you? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Right. Um, Good 
I think they had to be pretty specific on how the ball was picked up, but we added a lot of stuff in there. Okay. Um, and ultimately all we really wanted was this, the bristles and the squeaker button. Um, because I knew the patent was going to run up and it did. And, and, and since then the, the market's been flooded with okay. lots of ball launchers, but ours has these features that others don't. And we are actually less, okay. uh, the price is less now to go back, you know, once I got this patent, um, I shopped it around for a year at least. I even went straight to Chuck it. I thought, hey, these guys be the perfect guys, right? Okay. There was a closed door. They did not want to hear it. Uh, the, the, the owner at the time uh, was transitioning to sell his business. Anyway, I, I pulled back. Um, I went and pitched it to a lot of other companies. I ended up landing with a toy company that had a small pet division, and that was Jack Specific. Okay. And at the time, um, I signed an agreement with them. Uh, I did not get an advance. I did not get a guarantee. Okay. I just wanted to get one on the board. And uh, so we worked for about a year and a half, and it was not going anywhere. They just had no vested interest to make it or do anything with it. So at the two-year contract end, um, I was talking to another company, and they were really interested in it. And so I thought, all right, I want to get out of this other deal. I don't want to re-up. And so I said to them, and I offered them an offer I knew that they would refuse. And it was a super high uh, royalty rate. It was a big advance, big guarantee. And they said yes, which I was shocked okay. um, because I really wanted to go with this other partner. Uh, in the end, they actually ended up making the product because they had some skin in the game. Okay. Um, but it just gave me that. I think the confidence, knowing that I had another potential partner on the line, Helps. Um, I just played hardball and it worked. And since then, it's given me more confidence to do it without having a partner or a potential partner on the other end. Well, you, you know so. what's interesting um, that you saw an existing product that was out there that was doing well. You saw that you had some variations that you wanted to see personally because you're a dog owner. Yep. incorporated that into it you were able to work around some maybe of those claims i thought that was pretty smart for you to do that even at, even at the 13th hour that's pretty smart <laughs> and you licensed it you went out there and, and got a, someone interested but it didn't work out so you, you you picked it back up and you went after somebody else and then you were able to leverage it because you had some other demand i mean you did everything right well and then there's more to the story Okay. So they ended up making the product, um, and then they decided to close their pet division down. Oh, no. And so there was 9,000 units sitting in a warehouse that they were going to liquidate. Okay. So I saw an opportunity to buy some of that stock um, and run a Kickstarter campaign. Okay. So I ran the Kickstarter campaign on the point of not just to bring it to market, more maybe get some more exposure and get another licensee. Got it. Okay. So when I did do that, I did get another company that saw it because I was marketing it on Facebook and Instagram and all that. Um, and they came to me and they made me an offer. Uh, and so I'm now with a new company <laughs> called Spunky Pup, who right. is uh, actually one of the founders of HyperPet, who did the Canine Cannon and a bunch of other great launchers. So okay. I'm in really good company. Uh, we're in about a thousand doors right now. Um, it just went in at the beginning of this year and we'll see how things start going. So, so is that, would you say that's a typical journey for, um, inventors? Yeah, for sure. I mean, maybe <laughs> not that exact one, but, uh, okay. I had to stay the course for, for many, many years to, to get this thing, you know, across the line. All right. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing yeah. that few twists and turns. There's a lot of little lessons there now. But I want to talk about what are you doing now? Because you're you're in the industry, but you're you're doing things a little bit different, right? Yes. Um, about two years ago, um, I was working for before I started doing full time product development. I was with a publisher, and we were selling puzzles and games and all sorts of really cool art based products. And I would go to the toy shows. I'd go to all the different trade shows. And I realized that there was a lot of money being spent on trade show booths okay. and not a lot of people were doing it really correctly um, in the in the realm of some of the smaller companies were displaying with uh, small tabletops. And then the bigger companies were using these really big, monstrous, uh, you know, huge crates to set up fairly small booths. Um, I ran into a toy inventor uh, who owns a company called Begin Again Toys. 
And uh, he had a really interesting flat pack system that required no tools to set up. Um, it was kind of rudimentary at the time. It was just for his own purposes. And so when I left my job, I kind of started talking to him and saying, you know, this is really interesting technology. Um, it's already out there, but in the realm of trade shows where you've got these eight foot high, 10 by 10 spaces you have to conform to. Um, so we started chatting and, and, and I ended up getting some of the uh, designs that he had. And since then, we've created a company called Flatworks Displays. And we offer a solution that you can set up a 10 by 20 booth in under an hour with no tools, which means you don't have to set up uh, higher labor, which could be like 200 bucks an hour. Okay. And the crate that we ship the booth in, a whole 20 foot booth fits in a four by two foot crate, which then becomes your table. Nice. And that way you don't have to wait for your crate after the end of the show. So there's That's just a so, lot of wait, wait, wait a minute. That is really smart. You save them yeah. time. The breakdown is faster. What the product comes in is actually, you can use it in the display. I mean, th these are really smart. And this thing's really taken off for you, isn't it? Because it, it has. I yeah. see I see you at all these trade shows, but I see your product being shown at all these trade shows. It's kind of just exploded, hasn't it? It has. The last year, we've, we've grown threefold at least. Um, we're in all different markets, hardware, housewares, toy. Um, we're going to food. Uh, I'm on my way to the Astra show, which I, I used to uh, exhibit at with a, a company of mine. So there's a lot of shows I used to do um, with the company with this big, heavy booth. And I'm now bringing this technology to help smaller businesses and even bigger businesses save money. Um, I'm excited about it. I love going to trade shows and walking them. And I always am conflicted when I'm going to these trade shows because I'm trying to sell booths, but I'm also looking at products thinking like, ah, I can make that one better. But it. really, the only reason I went into this business was because there's no inventory. Um, we basically uh, make them on demand, and they're all made here in San Diego. Um, so I would, probably wouldn't go into a business with massive inventory levels. And that's why I think it's so interesting what you're doing with all of your, your teaching, all your students, is that you know licensing is, the, is definitely the game. And, and if you were to go and do something like I'm doing, there has to be a need and there has to be um, uh, less overhead. So I'm going to guess, what's your end game here? End game is sell as many booths as possible and sell to a company that actually, um, you know, sells a lot more booths than I do. Good. So, Hey, Josh, thank you very much for sharing all this information. Thank you. And, and congratulations on all your success. It seems like you're, you're using your creativity in many different uh, fields now in different categories. So it's it's been a long road, but um, we we are there and we're having a great time doing it. So all right, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much.